Hello and welcome to my channel, I Went to Lose Gaming. Are you ready for a DPS showdown of epic proportions? Well this isn't the video for you because in comparison to other DPS showdowns I've done, this one is a DPS slowdown. We'll be taking a look at how a healer, Kokomi, performs in comparison to the antiquated former best DPS character Diluc and the support character Mona. So normally in my DPS showdowns I push meta DPS characters to their limits. Every once in a while though I like to include characters that aren't typically considered top tier DPS characters in these videos. Now I think many of you might remember a poll that I did where I asked who you wanted to see compete in a DPS slowdown versus Kokomi. Barbara and Diluc are neck and neck in this poll. However, if you draw a vertical line between the two, you'll see that Diluc is actually a tiny bit ahead. Hey, so editing, I went to lose here. You'll have to ignore my kid in the background. He's uh, partying or something right now. When I was gathering clips for this DPS showdown, when I checked, Diluc was indeed ahead by a bit, but now if we take a look, we can see that Diluc is at 15.65% and Barbara, where is she? Is actually at 15.70%. So Barbara actually pulled ahead by 0.0. 5% or so than Diluc since the time that I actually checked when I started recording this video. Anyway, back to the video. As such, our favorite Batman LARPer Diluc is back. So if you're ready for the hot and the cold, the new and the old, then get ready for a DPS showdown. But before that, we have the most exciting part of the video, character builds, damage potentials, methodology, and disclaimers. Let's talk about the approach in this video or the methodology first. I really wanted to focus on each of the characters own damage outputs and their supporting capabilities. Kokomi and Mona are both great support characters. And as such, they are easily slotted into many teams where all they do is support. So as usual, we will have a segment on solo overworld damage output to demonstrate their DPS capabilities. For the Abyss 12 run, I will demonstrate both their freeze supporting capabilities as well as their performance where their damage is the main factor. As for Diluc, well, he is a terrible support character, so anything that he's in, he will be the main DPS. Sorry, Diluc, no freeze support participation showdown for you. Next, let's talk about the damage potentials. Damage potentials in this video are actually a little tricky due to the nature of gearing Kokomi. Kokomi is a character who has a really high floor and a really low ceiling. Ceiling. Regardless, I try to keep her damage potential in line with the other two. Her damage potential ranges from 80 to 86% throughout this video. As a main DPS, I use the world's most expensive donut and the Ocean Hue Clam. And as a support, well her damage potential doesn't matter anymore and I use her with the tenacity and a support catalyst like the Thrilling Tails or Hakushin Ring. Mona is even trickier than Kokomi. She can focus on her burst damage or her basic attack damage. Her weapon options are also all over the place too. Interestingly, the Skyward Atlas's damage is non-negligible for Mona and I do not have a Refinement 5 Memory of Dust. As such, we'll be using the Skyward Atlas for most of the overworld showcases. Unfortunately, my Heart of Death is poo poo, but with some crit food and resonances, Mona's damage potential for her basic attacks is more comparable to the other two contestants. For the free support showcase portion, Mona is using the Tenacity and the Thrilling Tails. Anyway, the OG Batman LARPer Diluc is finally back and he's grumpy as always. My artifacts haven't changed at all for him, but I will be using him at around 95% damage potential for the overworld, which is higher than the other two. This is because true Diluc mains have been farming the Crimson Wish domain since the first week of Genshin Impact's release. So it's actually somewhat common to see many Diluc mains with nearly perfect artifacts. And now with the contestants lined up and raring to go, it's time for everyone's favorite parts of the video, the disclaimers. All the runs in this video can be improved. I simply do each of these runs a few times and pick the best time for each of the situations. I'm not here to grind infinitely just to save a few frames to a few seconds. Each of these runs are done to the best of my abilities and problem solving within a reasonable amount of time. This is simply an anecdotal comparison between these characters at my levels of investment. Because my characters are all at constellation 6 or 5 and 5, this is not an accurate reflection of their power levels at lower constellations. Just because character A is better than character B in a specific scenario does not mean that character A is better than character B. Please take everything with a giant grain of salt. We can finally get started with our very first and favorite volunteer, the Cryo Registrar. <laughs> so 
someone give this plant a best volunteer of the year reward because in every DPS showdown we murder it multiple times. Kokomi's run is actually very straightforward. Perhaps the only thing to note is timing the ocean hued clam's first explosion from her precasted jellyfish with when the cry ridge slime becomes vulnerable. Then Kokomi does what Kokomi does by mashing that left click button after using her burst and thus drowning our poor plant friend in 6 seconds. Mona's run is interesting as I need to build up her Constellation 6 by holding dash for 3 seconds and also precast her elemental skill and activate the Skyward Atlas's passive with a couple normal attacks. With all this stuff ready to go, Mona dominated, crushed, and obliterated the competition by half a second. How very impressive. Ah yes, our dilapidated DPS character Deluke. I hope you like your reruns because we'll be watching the full length feature film The Dawn of the Elemental Burst many more times during this DPS showdown. The Dawn of the Elemental Burst is almost a DPS loss with how slow it is, especially without vape or melt. Nonetheless, Deluke smoked our poor Regis fine friend in an agonizingly slow 7.2 seconds. Our next volunteer is a far beefier target that also allows precasting the Primo Geo Vishap. Somehow Kokomi dominated this fight in comparison to the other two. Once Kokomi gets her burst and jellyfish up, she outputs some very consistent and reliable DPS. Also, she has enough downtime on her burst for her teammates to help battery her up for a second burst with minimal opportunity cost. Her second burst neatly aligned with the Primo Geovishap blowing itself up, thus amplifying her damage output and soaking our Geovishap friend in a blistering 22.7 seconds. Honestly, when it comes to using Mona as a main DPS character, I have no idea what is optimal. Given the random nature of her Constellation 2 and her Constellation 6 existing, it's hard to say what is her optimal normal attacking options. Because Mona's damage is mostly front-loaded with her burst and Constellation 6, unfortunately in a longer sustained fight, Mona fell short compared to the other two and completed this the slowest at 28.9 seconds. The Batman LARPer is next and at a much higher damage potential than the other two, he managed to squeak past Mona by about a second and a half. Unfortunately, the Primo Geo Vishep's hitbox is really wonky and melee attacks often whiff against it. Once the loot goes through most of his pyro infusion, it's time to batter him up and watch a second showing of the full length featured film, The Dawn of the Elemental Burst, in a single fight. In the end, Deluke beat the Primo Geo Vishep in a respectable 26.5 seconds. As with all my DPS showdowns, I include a multi-phase boss fight. The Magu Kenki happens to be a great option for this as it has two very distinct phases. Kokomi, like many characters that have downtime during their infusions, finds it hugely beneficial to precast her burst so it can be ready again for the Puppet King's second phase. And by intentionally doing less damage to the Magu Kenki, this delays the Magu Kenki's transition to his second phase. This delay allows Kokomi to line up her second burst with when the Magu Kenki becomes vulnerable again and take it out before it yeets on out of there across the entire map. Kokomi washed away the competition with a blistering 21.2 second clear time. 
Mona did respectably well here, but I cannot help but feel that all my Mona runs can be drastically improved from RNG alone. For one, the Memory of Dust is significantly better for her personal damage than the Skyward Atlas, but I'm not sure if the Skyward Atlas's bonus damage is better than the improved damage from the Memory of Dust. Anyway, Mona was unable to take out the Magu Kenki's second form before it teleported away. Despite that, this was still an easy fight for her and she managed to complete this a little slower than Diluc at 29.1 seconds. Diluc did reasonably well here, thanks to his burst, low energy cost, and low cooldown. And although we watched the entirety of the film The Dawn of the Elemental Burst twice during this fight, it all took place during the Magu Kenki's invincibility windows, thus bypassing the issue of its long cast time. Diluc, however, was also unable to take out the Magu Kenki's second form prior to it teleporting away, but he still managed to land in second place overall against our puppet friend. The last solo damage output showcase for this video is Super Masanori. In case you aren't aware, Masanori goes Super Saiyan and becomes much more difficult from midnight to 2am. I swear it used to be from midnight to 4am, but for some reason, right now it's midnight to 2am. Wow, well Kokomi managed to dominate this fight. During her burst, it's clear that without reactions, Kokomi's sustained single target DPS is actually significantly higher than Deluxe and Mona's. Super Masanori has passive healing, which can be a serious problem. But Kokomi does just the right amount of damage during a single burst to wipe out an entire health bar. As such, the second form of Masanori also just required a single burst from Kokomi to take out. Kokomi absolutely dominated this fight. This fight was really unpleasant with main DPS Mona. Not only is Mona's damage very random thanks to the Skyward Atlas, lower curve rate and her constellation too, Masanori's healing is a huge issue. The longer the fight, the more Masanori heals. Also, due to Masanori's extreme mobility, Mona's long charge attack animations and elemental skill would often whiff. Also, when Masanori puts up his guard, I have to get lucky with Zonli's whole D to knock him out of it or run around his entire back, neither of which are great for taking him out as fast as possible. Anyway, after three bursts for Mona, she was finally able to take out our favorite Night Owl Samurai, Masanori, in 50 seconds. Diluc is again last but not least. Masanori is an impressively agile man as he dashes across the arena, but after a lot of trial and error and some great RNG and watching the Dawn of the Elemental Burst movie three times total during this fight, Diluc took out Masanori in a very reasonable 41.4 seconds. Now let's go back to the Primo Geovish app really quick, but this time with a full team and even food amplifying each character's damage. So I tried a vape build with Kokomi, but was unfortunately unable to take out the Primo Geovish app in a single cycle. However, equally surprisingly in my opinion was this team was able to take out the Primo Geovish app in a single cycle. Now equally unfortunately though, for a nuking situation like this, Kokomi was unable to quickly burst down the Primo Geovish app, but was also able to one cycle it. As for Mona, well I don't think this is the fastest way I could nuke down the Primo Geovish app, but it sure is a satisfying way to milk out a giant damage number. Unfortunately, Mona's nuke setup is comparatively convoluted and slow to other popular nuke setups like for example Raiden, 
but despite that, it was still completely trivial for her to one-shot the Primo Geo Vicia. Deluke is surprisingly a solid nuker, but frankly, so is every Pyro character when combined with Constellation 4 Ayaka. Ayaka's Constellation 2 provides enough cryo application for even Pyro characters to comfortably melt for a few seconds. As such, Deluke effortlessly two-shot our poor Primo Geofishep friend. It was actually a bit faster than Mona in this situation, but I'm pretty sure I could improve Mona's time here. And as with every DPS showdown that I've created, it's time for an Abyss 12 showdown. For this Abyss 12, I wanted the damage to mostly come from these characters, and after using them as the main DPS character, I'll demonstrate how Mona and Kokumi work as free supports. Anyway, Diluc and Kokumi will have Xing Chou to support them and provide a lot of off-field damage while Mona will use Kui to help with nuking and provide some additional on-field DPS. <laughs> Unfortunately, 1211 is an absolute menace for all three of these characters. The two big wolves are so incredibly unpredictable and mobile, and they start super far away from each other. Kokomi has a slight advantage in ease of use here thanks to her ranged homing attacks. Unfortunately, this Kokomi team is lacking in reliable AoE damage, but despite all that, the two big wolves sat still for the longest time which allowed Kokomi's team to essentially one cycle them. Mona's burst and damage is impressively almost enough to wipe out the entire first wave even without Bennett's buff, and although it's likely possible in the amount of time I spent on this with Mona, I personally could not set up a big nuke on the two big wolves after wiping out the first wave of baby wolves. So instead, I decided to conserve Mona's burst for the next chamber and instead abuse Klee's knockback which was very helpful for keeping the big wolves down long enough for Mona and Klee to actually finish them off. Deluke didn't fare any better than the two Hydro Catalyst users here. Although this run is highly flawed, this was still somehow my fastest run while also keeping Xingqiu's burst available for the next chamber. Anyway, Xingqiu is almost able to single-handedly wipe out the first wave. Then Deluke swooped in to activate the Wolf's Gravestone passive against the puppies. And of course, the two large Rift Hounds are as annoying as you'd expect them to be. They are not only super durable and have high resistances, they also have really fat hitboxes, so Deluke is effectively just a single target damage character against them. Miraculously, I managed to get a quadruple vape against the last big doggo without even Xingqiu's burst, doing up to 100k damage somehow per hit to reasonably clear 1211 while also having Xingqiu's and Deluke's bursts ready for the next chamber. It's finally the next chamber, and this one is a much welcomed reprieve in comparison to the previous one. Sadly, Kokomi's lack of AoE really hurt her performance in comparison to the other two contestants. Kokomi had to one by one gun down the tall boys. With all that being said and done though, I frankly think Kokomi's performance here was nothing short of impressive, given that we're using Kokomi, a little healer, as the main source of damage.
1221 is a much better chamber for Mona as she's able to effortlessly deliver a 282,208 damage nuke to both the Rune Raiders, after which it was trivial for Klee to finish them off with her Jumpty Dumpties and charged attacks. And we finally have an optimal situation for our boy Luke. We have two immobile targets that do not get launched across the entire map by his full length featured film, The Dawn of the Elemental Burst, that also have overlapping hitboxes for Deluc to abuse his rather narrow AoE. Deluc is joyfully cleaving away and vaping against both these tall boys doing impressive 80 to 100,000 vapes. Deluc won this chamber with his clear time of 16.7 seconds. And we have another nice and easy chamber with 1231. <laughs> Although this chamber is easy, it still has the problem of having multiple spread out targets of which Kokomi and Xingqiu essentially treat this as a single target fight. Despite throwing water balloons at each of these robots one at a time, Kokomi still cleaned out this chamber in just 17.8 seconds. It's Mona's time to shine as everyone has their bursts ready and she can set up a beefy nuke against all three robots. By doing the usual wait for 2 seconds for Mona's ICD on her burst to refresh, I then use Klee to jumpty dumpty the robots at two different angles to one shot the snakes on each side and then to overlap the jumpies on the middle robot to take it out as well. An interesting but effective strategy for 1231. Deluc is next and he had a similar issue to Kokomi wherein this felt like a single target fight for him. However, he has access to vape which is hugely multiplicative to either his damage or Xing Cho's damage. Deluc managed to clear this somewhere between the two Hydro Catalyst users in 16.5 seconds. There's one last showcase where no boys are allowed, and that is, what about using Kokomi and Mona as free supports? So this is actually a very nuanced situation where each character has their advantages. Now you may see the closeness in the times here and think that they were actually very comparable, but the reality is that Kokomi opens up a completely different strategy for 1211 that I personally wasn't able to pull off here. Mayaka's artifacts are simply not good enough for that strategy, but because Kokomi does not need to swap back onto the field to keep the two big bulls frozen, Shenhe and Ayaka are able to funnel energy to Ayaka for the next round. Unfortunately, I was never able to achieve a full energy Ayaka for 12-2-1, but that alone saves around 6 seconds off this entire run. So Ayaka can actually do this in 26 seconds. With Mona, unfortunately, filling up Ayaka's energy is practically impossible, since Mona takes up screen time to use her burst to refreeze the big doggos. This takes away the ability for Shenhe and Ayaka to funnel energy to Ayaka. Anyway, with Constellation 6 Shenhe and Ayaka, damage is much less of an issue, and Mona's long animations and damage amplification just aren't as valuable in comparison. However, for most players, with how Constellation 6 Shenhe and Ayaka, both Kokomi and Mona are great choices and are clearly insanely good in Freeze teams. And while I might make fun of Deluke's long burst animation, Mona's burst animation is actually just as long. While Mona's omen adds a lot of damage, there is a real opportunity cost by taking away screen time from Ayaka and Shenhe. Whew, that took me a lot of effort to compile all of these runs, and here are the results. 
Meanwhile, in the background, I have a Kokomi Taser run for the top half of the Vis-12, where she cleared it in 46.6 seconds, way faster than using Kokomi, Mona, or Diluc as primary sources of damage. Ultimately, supports like Kokomi and even Mona are best at supporting. Despite saying that though, Kokomi is a hilariously viable main DPS character, especially at Constellation 6 with Refinement 5. However, we're talking about Diluc levels of power roughly. In today's day and age, this amount of investment for this amount of DPS power simply isn't worth it from a primo gem to power ratio perspective. And literally roughly one third the amount of primo gems, the Raiden Shogun does about triple the amount of DPS as Kokomi does. However, Kokomi has tons of uses outside of her being the main DPS character. She is one of the best healers in the game, is an amazing free support character, arguably the best, and a great driver for other off-field DPS characters like a Taser team or even Vape with Xiang Ling. Frankly, Kokomi has been one of my favorite characters as of recently. And while she lacks the explosive damage that characters like Raiden, Ganyu, and Ayaka have, Kokomi is a perfectly reasonable character even as a main DPS. The Ocean Hue Clam and her reliability all improve her viability, and Kokomi even handily won the overworld portion of this DPS showdown. However, in full team situations, Kokomi's personal damage output suffers because attack buffs like Bennett barely buff her damage, and she struggles at reliably doing big vapes like the other two characters in this DPS showdown do. As for Mona, well I'm not going to lie, but using Mona as a main DPS character was very stressful and difficult. Her animations feel really clunky in comparison to modern characters, and her damage being extremely random thanks to Constellation 2 does not help. However, it's great to see that even Mona, a burst support character, is not colossally behind Diluc and Kokomi, even while functioning as a main DPS character. Mona of course has access to some monstrous hydro nukes, although cumbersome to use. Mona functions as a great damage amplifier for freeze teams as well as demonstrated earlier, and I believe using Mona as a main DPS character will take me more time to familiarize Rise. And if the situation arises for me to do something like this again with Mona, I'm sure to improve at using her as a main DPS. Anyway, despite her shortcomings as a main DPS character due to the RNG nature of Constellation 2 and the highly situational and clunky Constellation 6, Mona really wasn't that far behind. Now Diluc has always been a touchy subject on my YouTube channel, but lately I've actually seen less of it. For a long time now, I have included Diluc in my DPS showdowns and his performance has been rather consistent since his release. Unfortunately, Diluc has not had any buffs to him outside of Kazuha's release. And Kazuha, well, he buffs every Pyro, Electro, Cryo, and Hydro character, not just Diluc. I also had Shintenzu try speedrunning the top half of Viz 12 with his Diluc, and he essentially got the same time as my Diluc did. Link to Shintenzu's YouTube channel will be in the description below, and I highly recommend him for Diluc and Xiao content. Now I do believe Diluc has a lot of room to improve on his Abyss 12 run with possibly a Melt setup, but the same can be said for Mona's run as well with more creative vape setups. And all of this completely pales in comparison to Raiden Shogun completing the entire top half of Abyss 12 faster than any of these characters can complete the very first chamber of Abyss 12. Nonetheless, Diluc is still easily able to clear the hardest content in the game at Constellation 6 and Refinement 5. However, I do feel that with every patch that comes, Diluc is feeling more and more antiquated as a main DPS character. So there you go, another DPS slowdown featuring much less meta DPS characters. What do you think about Kokomi's performance here, as well as Mona's and Diluc's? Also, I regularly make Genshin Impact videos, ranging from Caesar showcases, DPS showdowns, guide videos, and more. So be sure to smash the subscribe button as it's the best and easiest way for you to support my work. Also, don't forget to like the video and leave a comment for the YouTube algorithm. As always, I appreciate every single one of you. This is I Went to Lose, signing out.